Good morning. This is Rekha Shanai. Welcome to the Narratives Project, Narratives in Pharmacology and Medicine. The aim of this video lecture series is to bring to you stories on the theme Evolving Medicine. Medical sciences are constantly evolving. Our understanding of the pathophysiological basis of diseases, the diagnostic methods, the therapeutic approaches and even drug discovery methods are advancing. This is an attempt to capture and compile these stories as told by those who have been practicing medicine and have been witnessing this transition. Today, we have our first lecture series, The Evolution of Urinary Stone Management. The speaker, Dr. Joseph Thomas, is a professor of urology and previously been the head of the department at Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. With more than 25 years of medical practice in the urology department, Dr. Thomas is specialized in urinary stone disease with expertise in pediatric urology. Let's listen to Dr. Joseph's lecture. For ease of recording and uploading, this lecture will be divided into two parts. And before we begin, please switch your phones to silent mode and restrict your movement inside the hall. We shall also have an interaction and questionnaire session at the end of this lecture. And for our viewers, do watch and enjoy our episodes. Kindly log into the channel, leave your suggestions, your comments. You may also write to us at the email ID given below. Over to you, Dr. Joseph Thomas. We'll start. Yes. I'm extremely happy that uh, I have been called for the first narrative in uh, evolution of medicine. But this is not a medical uh, evolution which I am trying to cover. I am trying to look for uh, what is happening for the stone disease. They're not the stones which we see, the precious metal uh, stones, but the stones which we are uh, treating on a daily basis. As urologists, we treat stones. That is the commonest uh, malady which most of the people uh, with urological problems suffer. And it is a history of uh, evolution of medicine. So this is something which I thought I will cover and an apt title I thought I will give. Cut four stones yesterday, today and uh, tomorrow. Hopefully I am saying not in yesterday, I am saying today and hopefully something more will come in the future. This is the Hippocrates uh, who is uh, trying to treat a medical uh, person with uh, so many medical uh, forms of treatment which were available at that time and on the other side is a modern urologist uh, who is trying to treat. You can see how the apparel has changed, how the stethoscope has come uh, in between, how the snakes have disappeared, the concepts of disease have changed and the understanding and the management of urinary stone disease also has changed and this is a narrative which looks into what has happened, what has become historical and what has become uh, more and more uh, newer forms of treatment of urological uh, stone disease. Urinary stones are nothing new, it has been discovered in the Egyptian uh, mummies as early as 4500 to 5000 uh, year old mummies which has been discovered in 1901. Urinary stone disease has been uh, found out. So it is nothing, it is not a new disease, it is a historical uh, disease, it has not been uh, historical disease which has not been eradicated but it has been evolved in his understanding and the treatment. So I thought uh, for this, I will look into what has happened in the understanding of the urinary stone disease, his treatment and more so from a surgical point of view rather than from a medical point of view. The urinary stone diseases were very big. It, there was a time probably 40, 50 years back then the stones were very big. You can feel the stones but nowadays the stones have become smaller and smaller and this is the x-rays which show that there is a stone and we are classical teaching of a radio opaque stone versus a radio lucent stone and how it is a uric acid stone versus an oxalate stone. The stone uh, composition has not changed uh, much other than we are becoming more and more a prosperous uh, society so more and more uh, calcium oxalate stones are forming rather than uh, calci calcium phosphate uh, stones. So the stone disease have also changed. The incidence has not changed much but uh, the composition of stones have uh, changed. I am concentrating on this narrative on the bladder stone because that is something which has uh, affected mankind for a long time. It is still being affected. So what has happened to stones? So from stones have been gone to urinary stones and now to bladder stones. These are x-rays of uh, bladder stones which were quite a big stones earlier. Nowadays it is becoming smaller and smaller but still it is being uh, seen. This is a stone Man is not the only person uh, who is having stones. Dogs also have uh, stones and it is more costly to treat dogs uh, than uh, human beings because uh, more and more the money is being spent on uh, dogs rather than human beings. So more and more uh, technological advancements are also there to treat uh, urinary stones in uh, 
dogs. Dogs are the other uh, animals which share the same thing. So, the same expertise in uh, medicine, same expertise in pharmacology and in the surgical treatment has affected veterinary practice also. So, human practice and veterinary practice is going hand in hand. I don't know whether some of you will become a veterinary pharmacologist. Gone are the days when we used to take uh, big stones, very nice looking uh, mulberry stones, nice uh, egg-shaped uh, stones, which were taken and kept as uh, mementos in our uh, department and most of the urologists and most of the surgeons and most of the medical colleges used to have uh, big, big stones which are kept in the museum. And at one time, we had uh, big stones in the bladder which was kept as a memento on our uh, table. Gone are the days where uh, we are not able to see such a big type of stone. So, something has happened which has changed uh, the type and the size of the stones. The treatment of urinary stones is very well described in the Indian uh, text in uh, Susruta. Even though the picture which is shown there is more of a rhinoplasty rather than a lithotomy for stones. Even in the Hindu text, the Charaka Samhita and the Susruta Samhita, urinary stone disease is mentioned and there are some instruments which have been described which has been used for removing stone disease. So, India is not uh, behind in uh, treatment of the understanding of stone disease and treatment of uh, stone disease along with the Greek uh, Hippocrates who also thought about uh, stone disease. These were the, some of the paintings of uh, surgery in uh, olden days where there were no anesthetists. The pharmacologists have made uh, anesthetic drugs uh, available. You can see in the pain and the agony of the patient uh, who is suffering from a surgical uh, insult by a trained, uh, probably a trained uh, surgeon. So, the type of anesthesia also has changed, the understanding has changed, the training has changed, the surgical uh, techniques have changed, the anesthetic medicines have changed which has uh, really made a difference in the surgical uh, treatment of uh, stone disease. What interested me was when I joined for MBBS, I used to, we all used to take a Hippocrates uh, oath. And in the Hippocrates oath at uh, a young age, we didn't know what was written there. Most of the time, uh, this first years, we never understood what was written there. And subsequently, later in my training, I understood that there are three things which are mentioned in Hippocrates oath, uh, which is a little uh, controversial. It is mentioned about euthanasia. A doctor will not participate in euthanasia. A doctor will not participate in abortion. That two parts are controversial. I hope somebody else will cover that uh, narrative. Why euthanasia and abortion is not there in the Hippocrates oath and how it has evolved. I will be using the third one, never to use knife. And uh, the, if you follow the Hippocrates oath, which I have taken uh, when I joined as an MBBS uh, student, every day I am breaking that uh, bow and I am using the knife to cut the stone. So, what has happened? So, when Anup came and asked me, I thought I will uh, talk on not to use a knife. Why Hippocrates? Uh, thought like that and what has happened where we still use uh, knives. This is exactly what is given in the Hippocrates oath translation. I will not cut persons laboring under stone. Stone means uh, urinary stone. But leave this to be done by practitioners of this work. That means the surgeons are considered little inferior to the physicians uh, who are uh, supposed to be better people uh, trained in uh, treating stone disease and surgeons were considered little inferior to the physicians of those uh, period. And but the other way of looking at it is Hippocrates probably thought that this should be a surgery who is perform, which is performed by somebody who is better trained for its execution because the surgeons of those days were unscrupulous and irresponsible individuals who were not uh, practicing uh, surgery. So, two ways of looking at the Hippocrates oath, I will not use knife means that either it should not be used by untrained people or as a whole it was condemned. So, this Hippocrates oath had given rise to a lot of controversies in uh, modern uh, medicine. Why he said that I will never use a knife. That means all the surgical specialties will uh, go out. But there are Hippocratic aphorisms which say that surgery was still considered part of the treatment by Hippocrates uh, principles because this is an aphorism. Those diseases that medicine does not cure are cured by knife. That means he doesn't uh, totally disagree with uh, the surgical uh, treatment. Those that the knife does not cure are cured by fire. I don't know what uh, that means. And the last part is those that fire does not cure must be incurable. Nowadays also we have incurable uh, diseases. So, some diseases are treated by medicine, some are by surgery. So, Hippocrates as a whole does not uh, say that surgical treatment should not be done. So, why that aphorism that I will not cut for stones? So, I thought I look into that is the yesterday of a urinary stone disease which I thought. The Greeks never believed in uh, opening up the body because the human body is considered uh, sacrosanct and uh, if you open up the body, lot of things can happen. So, surgery was valued less than uh, medical cure. And Hippocrates did not forbid surgery. Hippocrates has described about anal fistulae, hemorrhoids, phlebotomy, fractures and 
the clause of preventing surgery probably could have been added in the middle ages because the middle ages there were a lot of influences in uh, modern medicine and uh, probably this never to use knife was not there in the original Hippocrates oath it was subsequently added on in the middle ages. Hippocrates forbade one speciality. He did not forbade uh, all the surgical treatment because anal fistula, hemorrhoids, phlebotomy, fracture he allowed. But then why did he say that surgical treatment of stones should not be done? As a whole, he was condemning uh, urological uh, practice. Why only this speciality was, uh, only one disease was uh, not allowed? Is there a prejudice against uh, lithotomy? Because in uh, lithotomy in uh, Greek, there, was a, there are religious uh, fears affect. Uh, because they had a feeling that once you do lithotomy, there will be a law, there will be a loss of ability to father uh, children. So that was considered something great and uh, not uh, manly. Once you do a procedure which is going to affect somebody's uh, manliness, it is something which has to be condemned. And a self-respecting physician cannot practice in that. So as a whole, lithotomy was condemned. That was one uh, way of looking at uh, why lithotomy was uh, condemned. And then unfortunately, bladder stone was the one which was coming into that. The other one is the cut also could mean that castration. Castration was a uh, procedure which was uh, commonly done among the Romans uh, because of various uh, reasons. But lithotomy could also end up in uh, castration. If you know, uh, remember the perineal anatomy, you have to go through the testes to facilitate uh, reaching the bladder or you will be doing a procedure which ends up in a lot of uh, bleeding and uh, fistula and infection and ultimately it ends up loss of uh, testes. And the Greek culture was not in favor of castration. So cutting for stone again was condemned. So one, on one side it was a problem which could be, uh, which could result in major uh, loss of uh, manliness. The other way around is the surgical technique itself could result in major problems. So lithotomy as a whole was banned by the Hippocratic uh, principles. The commonest way of removing the bladder stone was through the perineum. Because abdomen was something which everybody was uh, worried. Abdomen is a Pandora's uh, box with a lot of intestines. Uh, if you do something there, fecal fistula and the patient will die. So everybody was worried about uh, going through the abdomen. So the easiest way is perineum. Only two testes are there, nothing much will happen to that. So everybody went through the perineum. And uh, But the injuries to the bladder are fatal. Once the bladder is cut, there was a concept that people will die because once the bladder is cut, there will be urine. Urine will not uh, clot like uh, blood. Urine will produce infection. It will uh, spread all around and patient will die. So the concept at that time was if you injure the bladder, patient will die. The concept which has not changed now, even if you have an uh, unidentified bladder injury, now patient may die. So what are you trying to do? On one side, you want to remove the stone in which the patient is suffering. So beneficence or in the beneficence, the patient will lose his life. So patients, the stone is out. As we commonly say that surgery is successful, but the patient uh, died. So what was there? You have to protect the patient from harm and uh, preserve life. So patients had to be protected from the harm of surgery, which is with good intention trying to treat it, but it will end up in uh, harm. And Hippocrates wanted to protect his disciples like any other true teachers. He wanted to protect his disciples. So he said, you please Please don't uh, follow this procedure and it will end up in problem, it will lose your uh, name, which happens even now when a doctor lands in problem, he can lose his uh, name. So he said that, don't do it and leave it to the skilled individuals who could do this procedure. So that was the another way of looking at uh, this thing because perineal lithotomy was associated with uh, major catastrophe which resulting in removal of the stone but loss of the patient. And these are some of the pictures which uh, depict how, how Nowadays, we will say how cruel two, three strong bodied uh, people are holding on to the patient. It is called a manual anesthesia and not a general anesthesia or spinal anesthesia. We go it and uh, do it fast and uh, get out as much as uh, fast, fast as the possible before the patient kicks you or uh, something happens. So, do lithotomy, do it and run off fast. And some of the reports uh, say that some of the good surgeons, expert surgeons, could do within uh, one minute to two minutes, go into the bladder, get the stone out, and run for his uh, life because uh, there, there can be catastrophic complications. And uh, some of the, again, some of the paintings where uh, the second uh, picture on the left side, which shows that there is a patient, uh, patient party who is sitting by the side and he has fallen asleep waiting for uh, something to happen. So these are all pictures which uh, depict how brutal and how lethal a procedure was uh, the lithotomy. Some of the anatomical uh, drawings which have, uh, which we look very crude at this uh, stage because the anatomical uh, things which they never had any idea how through the perineum they have gone and into the bladder. Even now I 
I feel very bad uh, looking at these pictures. How they would have reached without knowing the anatomy right into the bladder, their only aim was to get the stone out and run for their uh, life. But slowly, it changed into urethral guidance. They recognized that something could be passed through the urethra. Lot of things have been devised, the gold, silver, uh, metal uh, things, then uh, plant things, the rabbit, uh, the sheep, uh, ureter, lot of things were used to put through the urethra. And urethra is one part of the human body where you can easily reach inside and uh, do whatever you want in the bladder. That is why the bladder stones were undergoing a treatment at that uh, time. So perineal with urethral guidance. Instead of the perineum, they were using a urethral guidance to feel for the stone and this is one of the first incidences where you can put an instrument into the bladder and sound for stone because there were no x-rays at that time so how do you know whether somebody is having a stone you pass a metal instrument into the bladder and feel for the stone so sounding from a stone which was a principle which I evolved later which even now sometimes you feel okay I can feel a stone which was there long time back in uh, in the early period where uh, without any knowledge of anatomy they used the same uh, principle and there were specially designed instruments to go through the perineum, through the bladder, through the prostate, go right into the bladder. And even at that time, they understood that the stones have to be removed intact. If you leave behind some stones in the track or somewhere, it will recur, there will be bleeding, there will be infection. So their understanding of the disease was not uh, primitive. It was uh, something uh, great which you should appreciate because over a period of time, you have also understood the same thing. You leave behind a stone and then there will be infection and the patient will have more problems. And very good instruments were uh, devised which will uh, help them in removing the stone either intact or with uh, after uh, breaking and uh, these are some of the pictures which depicts uh, how no gloves look at that uh, surgeon who has no gloves he has gone into the bladder got the stone intact and he is a successful surgeon of that uh, type even though the physicians have not accepted him as a surgeon and even Hippocrates has said that it should not be done by somebody who is good in the field but leave it to somebody who is uh, Probably they considered it as a quack at that uh, time. Lot of instruments have been uh, developed and uh, the instrument on the other, uh, Bigelow's uh, evacuator is something which they recognize that you have to break the stone and take out the stone. So lot of instruments have developed. Instead of a blind procedure, it is slowly becoming a uh, uh, procedure which can be done under uh, vision. And there were a lot of lithotomies which have been described from where you go it. There are some things which you can grow with very small uh, small number of instruments which is called a lesser operation, there can be a greater operation, there are a lateral operation because they come through the lateral side of the perineum and they go inside and take it out. Nobody was uh, confident enough of going through the abdomen because they were all worried about the abdomen. Once you go through the abdomen, intestines are injured, fecal fistula will die and their patient will definitely die. But it is quite uh, ingenious that they have gone through the rectum. Through the rectum, they have entered the bladder and taken out the stone. There is a proctosystostomy. So these are five uh, technical uh, descriptions which are there in the literature about how to take out the stones. It is quite interesting to read these, uh, these uh, reviews of how they have taken to take out the stone. Suprapubic lithotomy was not popular because there was no anesthetic. When there was no anesthetic, the patient will be keeping on straining. And when there is straining, the intestines will come down and there is more chance of peritoneal injury and uh, fistulae. There was no method of preventing uh, infection. There were no catheters available at that time. We have right and left uh, flexible urethral catheters. There were no catheters available at that time. So urine extravasated sepsis. And they understood that if you go through the abdomen, patient will die. So if there is any chance, it is better to go through the perineum. You will not inter injure the intestine. Only the patient will have again more tor uh, more uh, severe complications and still they may die. But they found that the abdominal approach is more complicated than the perineal uh, approach. And bladder stones was a common and moribund illness of that time. So the choice of that time was either suffer the pain every day or uh, at least uh, try to undergo surgery and probably get a cure. That was the problem at that time. Somebody who has a stone will have to have daily pain when they pass urine and the bladder stone pain is some of the, one of the severe uh, pains of uh, you know, with the human being can have delivery at least one delivery and pain is over. This is a problem which is happening every day four or five times in the day and three or four times at night. So every time there will be pain and that is how the word uh, strangury has been uh, come. And despite the oath which Hippocrates has taken, some people uh, used to remove stones because they were looking at uh, how to help the patients. We always believe that the patient should be treated and they were called as quacks. And uh, nicely they were called as uh, quacks, cutters or incisors as the urologists of the current era are known as uh, uh, plumbers or uh, <laughs> the, you know, whoever is cleaning the urinary system. But the surgeons conducted this. But 
one important thing one ethical standard is whoever is doing this should have a high ethical standard because he has to balance cure versus harm so i think the people who are doing these procedures had a very high ethical standard because on the one side they should avoid the complications and the other side they should avoid treating the patient so they were not quacks but they were known as quacks or cutters or incisors some victims uh, survived that was the most uh, positive attitude some victims survived so if you see the mortality rate it will be very very bad most of the patients would have died but prolonged pain of a stone of a bladder was great and there is a hope that lithotomy will be of much relief that was the concept in which uh, they did uh, lithotomy even though hippocrates said that i will not cut for stones there were people who were trained in the field who were doing uh, stone treatment and the larger message which comes out of hippocrates oath is untrained physicians should refer their patients to somebody who is uh, trained in their uh, field recognize and practice within one's own limits of knowledge a principle which holds good even now even though hippocrates said that i will not cut for stones but leave it to those who practice the profession that means on one side probably he was trying to belittle the people who were doing uh, surgical treatment or on the other side uh, he was telling to say that unless you have a qualification you should not uh, do it seek help from the better qualified people even now it happens when second opinion or you refer to a higher center but what i like as a urologist is he was the first one who defined and legitimized urology as the first recognized branch of medicine i think no other uh, no other branch of medicine uh, finds uh, origin in hippocrates so he was the first one to say that urology as a branch is uh, important i think i'll uh, stop now because 22 so this is the message which i want to leave from the first part of my talk yesterday this was a hippocrates oath which says that i will not cut for stones it doesn't mean that he has uh, despised the uh, taking stones i'll see it on a positive way which says that you don't cut stones unless you are qualified enough to do that give it to somebody who is qualified and i should thank him for being the father of urology and defined the urology for the first uh, time i think i'll uh, take a break so that you can uh,